so a couple of words about ARISC. Uh, the American Research Institute of the South Caucasus is an American overseas research center, an independent net for profit that supports research in the South Caucasus and the US. ARISC encourages and supports scholarly study of the South Caucasus states across all disciplines of the humanities, sciences, and social sciences. You can find more information about us and our future uh, upcoming lectures uh, by visiting our website, www.arisk.com. Org. And now let me introduce our today's speaker. Armine Babigyan is an occupational therapist with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Drexel University and Master of Science in Occupational Therapy from Columbia University. She's currently a fourth-year PhD candidate in Rehabilitation Sciences and Global Health at the University of Toronto. Her doctoral research explores disability discourses within rehabilitation policy and lived experience in Arme Armenia. Babigyan also is a research trainee at Canada's number one mental health hospital, Central of Addiction and Mental Health, where she partners with disability advocates to co-design inclusive research methods for communication differences. In addition, Armine volunteers as founding director of Therapies for Armenia, a multidisciplinary nonprofit organization that aims to strengthen Armenian rehabilitation and disability services. She has led several innovative humanitarian initiatives in Armenia and Artsakh, including authoring the first Armenian resource for caregivers of children with developmental disabilities and co-founding the first post-professional Armenian Rehabilitation Fellowship Program. As a result, Babigan is an invited member of the World Health Organization Armenia Rehabilitation Task Force and the recipient of several prestigious awards from the World Federation of Occupational Therapists, the American Occupational Therapist Association, and Columbia University. Uh, now I pass the floor to you, Armine, please. Thank you, Ani, for the introduction. Um, and hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Okay. Um, so hi, this is Armina speaking. Um, and just to uh, briefly introduce myself, uh, just for anyone with visual impairment, I am a, a woman with short brown hair wearing a navy blue dress. Um, and as Ani said today, I am discussing uh, No Participant Left Behind, um, a little reflection on some of the accessible research strategies I utilized uh, within my research experiences in Armenia. Um, so what we will be discussing today um, is uh, going over a little bit about language and terminology, uh, my positionality, uh, as well as a brief introduction about my research. Um, and I'll also talk about exclusion of people with disabilities within research, um, why accessible research is important, and then a few strategies that I utilized um, to make my research more accessible. Um, and then we'll have time at the end for discussion and question and answer. Um, I will just mention accessibility and inclusion involve continuous learning. So while I'll be discussing some of the strategies that I have experience with it may not be the best fit for every context. So um, it's important to always keep in mind the social, cultural, and political context uh, to implement the best accessibility approaches. Um, and I also hope we can have a nice open dialogue at the end, and I would love to hear other people's strategies as well. So um, I'm going to uh, describe uh, a little bit about the language I'll be using. Uh, the image here is the Armenian flag, red, blue, orange, in horizontal layers with a peace sign gesture, um, the pointer and middle finger raised. Um, so within disability studies, language can drive uh, conceptualization and representation. Um, and although within North America, many disability advocates prefer identity first language, which is disabled person. Um, in Armenian, the translation is hashmandam, which equates to cripple and has a negative connotation. 
Uh, the preference of Armenian disability advocates is Hashmandal Machun Unetsoh Ants, or a person first language, which translates to a person with a disability. Um, so that's the language I'll be utilizing during my presentation. Um, but when working with this population, I encourage you uh, to always ask what their preferences are because it varies. Um, Accessibility means that a person with a disability must be able to obtain the information as fully, equally, and independently as a person without a disability. Uh, this helps to promote inclusivity, enhance user experience, and support equal opportunity and participation. Universal design is uh, the design of products, environments, programs, and services that are usable by all people to the greatest extent possible uh, without the need for special adaptation or design. In an ideal world, uh, everything would utilize principles of universal design. Um, however, we are far from that. Um, and so that's why we have to implement our own accessibility strategies uh, in the meantime. Um, pictured here will be a web of circles with my positionality in the middle, surrounded by circles that describe my life experiences, um, as mentioned in my introduction. Um, when thinking about my positionality, um, I'm not neutral on this topic. Um, so my education is a blend between health and social sciences, my professional experiences, uh, working very closely with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, highlights the importance of understanding different ways of thinking, being, and doing. Um, I've had various volunteer experiences that really um, showed me my passion for advocacy and being a disability ally. My organization, Therapists for Armenia, um, we strongly collaborate with local partners and key stakeholders. Uh, my own personal values of appreciating diversity and inclusion, um, partially because of where I've lived in Queens, Philadelphia, London, Toronto, um, and Armenia, um, where I've had a really a sharp awareness about the impact of cultural and uh, contextual influences. So all of this has led me to my research topic related to disability rights within rehabilitation in international contexts. Um, my research study is a qualitative study guided by a critical social paradigm. Um, so this means that my research deals with social transformation, power, equity, and social justice. I use this theoretical stance to identify dominant ideas and challenge taken for granted quote unquote truths that underpin prevailing ideas and practices. Um, so this helps me to unpack assumptions and identify prevailing discourses um, within uh, rehab and disability. I also take a critical approach to rehabilitation, which challenges assumptions about normality um, and how rehab responds to the social and political dimensions of disability. Uh, critical disability theory also informs my research which centers on the lived experience of disability as a core tenet of interpreting um, the disability experience and the resulting power relations. Um, and I also use Baki's What's the Problem Represented to Be approach, or uh, WPR, um, which is an analysis of discourses um, focusing on the ways in which disability acquires a particular meaning um, and how it's problematized within the context of Armenian rehab. Um, so this is just to sort of understand where I'm coming from and um, and my approach to this topic. And uh, my doctoral research specifically looks at 
and compares representations of disability um, within rehab guidelines and comparing that with perspectives of service users with lived and living disability experiences. Um, so you can see why accessibility and inclusion are very important to my work, uh, but I also want to show why it should be important to everyone's work. Uh, people with disabilities make up 16% of the global population, and this number is increasing and expected to continue to increase due to different demographic and epidemiological changes, um, such as population growth, uh, increased number of people with non-communicable diseases, longer life expectancy, aging population, um, but this marginalized population often faces many disparities and inequities. Um, so while research can help bring awareness to these issues, people with disabilities are often excluded from research. And without appropriate medical or ethical justification, this can be discriminatory and can be a violation of human rights. Um, it also can limit the generalizability of the study results. So um, inclusion in research and accessibility are also actually highlighted within international law, the United Nations Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which has the highest number of signatories in the history for an opening day of a UN convention. Uh, it reaffirms that all persons with all types of disabilities must enjoy all human rights and fundamental freedoms. Um, and in different articles of the convention, it's highlighted that information needs to be accessible and data dissemination and international cooperation should include uh, people with disabilities. And uh, also, if your research can impact people with disabilities, then they should be included. Within disability rights, they emphasize nothing about us without us. Uh, this is also important for sustainability development. In 2015, all member states of the United Nations adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, um, which is this image here in a rainbow circle with dots around it, um, is the symbol for the Sustainable Development Agenda, uh, which is a set of 17 goals aimed to end poverty, improve health and education, reduce inequality, and spur economic growth. Uh, and this motto is leave no one behind, um, and disability has been recognized as a cross-cutting issue to be considered in the implementation of all goals. So we're just going to do a brief activity about why accessibility matters. Um, I will ask you to raise your hand um, or, or share in the chat if your answer is yes. Uh, I'm just going to see if I can see the chat. Um, it's a little tricky. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, I'm only able to see the chat, so <laughs> perhaps we'll do it that way. Okay, so just a few examples of why accessibility matters. Um, okay, so please write in the chat uh, or raise your hand if you have used a ramp rather than stairs. Okay, we have a hand raised. Couple hand raised, great. Okay, so a few people have. Thank you. Um, okay, my next question. Raise your hand if you use captioning while watching shows or videos. Okay, great. All right. And raise your hand if you've ever used text-to-speech or voice-to-text 
features on your mobile devices. So this is where it reads your message out loud or you speak into it and it types your message for you. Okay, again, quite a few people. Great. Um, so these are just a few examples of accessibility features that actually everyone benefits from. Uh, so same for research. Uh, it's accessibility really has several benefits. Um, so here are, thank you all for your uh, participation. Um, so here are a few ways that I tried to make my research more accessible. And again, just a reminder, this may not work for every context, um, but hopefully we can exchange some ideas about these. Uh, so the first thing is researchers recommend involving end users throughout the research process, starting from the very beginning. So for my research, the end users are rehabilitation service users, which are mostly people with disabilities. I'm not a person with a disability, and even though I work very closely with this population, I don't live it on a daily basis. So for that reason, I recruited an advisory committee of disability advocates from Armenia. Um, I met with them throughout my research to ensure their feedback and lived experience informs my research. And together we identified the issue and discussed methods for the research to be implemented in Armenia. And they're also involved in my data analysis and will be integral to my knowledge translation as well. Um, I also met with my advisory committee to discuss recruitment strategies. So pictured here is my recruitment flyer, which has short explanations about the study, who can participate, and what participants can expect. Um, my advisors mentioned that email attachments can be confusing or difficult for some people to open. Um, and so I also included this information in a simple bullet format within the text of an email. Um, I also made sure that the texts were large in size, so about size 16. Um, and we had different ways of sharing this information. So uh, email, um, paper flyers, social media, um, and then we also had different ways of contacting me if participants were interested. So I had my phone number, email, and also an online form. And with the online form, we really needed to make sure that it was accessible. I used Microsoft Forms because it has many accessibility features such as translation um, and the ability to change the text size. Um, and so I made every question uh, in large text. And um, I also asked how people prefer to be contacted as well, um, and I gave them options. Um, and then just wanted to show you, uh, you know, how the accessibility features work. So this is the immersive reader, um, which helps to read out loud what is on the form. It doesn't work for Armenian language, um, but for other major languages, um, it's a it's a really helpful option. So we have just here a short video to demonstrate how it works if anyone is unfamiliar. So they would click on the immersive reader icon and then it would open to this type of page and they one first name last name asterisk end of question close the reader to input your answer one first name okay so so that's how it works so it reads the the questions aloud so this is helpful for uh, people who um, may use a communication device or any other uh, assistive technology uh, to help with communication. Um, I also made a simplified consent form. Uh, so here on the left, you can see my standard consent form. Um, and then on the right, I made an easy read version. So the easy read has simple language. It's typically up to about a fourth grade level of uh, visuals. 
Uh, I use lists rather than paragraphs wherever possible. And again, large text. And this was all approved by my research ethics uh, committee as well. So it has all of the required information um, in a very simple and understandable way. I also, uh, after consenting my participants, I was asking them about what supports they might need to participate. So I asked about their communication style, what accessibility needs they have, what helps them to feel understood, if they need a support person to join them, if they need breaks. Um, so this all helped me to inform my data generation to make sure that I was prepared and, and had everything ready uh, that they might need to uh, fully participate in the study. So for my research, I hosted focus groups discussions. Um, and so I made sure that the room was accessible um, so that it had ramps, elevators, um, met different light or sound accommodations. Um, if it was a virtual uh, focus group discussion, we had captioning uh, as well. Again, this doesn't work so well for different languages, but for English, it's, uh, it's better. And uh, also for surveys, I had a, a demographic survey. Um, and so I had actually a regular version and a large text version. Um, I ended up just using the large text version that was preferred by uh, all the participants, honestly. Um, and uh, we also used um, special pens uh, for the paper-based uh, form. And so these, this is an image of a blue and black, a uh, very thick pen. Um, so the way this works, it, it's just much easier to grasp because they are larger. So this can help people with arthritis or joint issues, hand weakness or pain. Um, and I, they were very easy to, uh, purchase through Amazon. Um, and I also had, as I said, an online form uh, format as well using the previous um, format of the Microsoft Forms with different accessibility options. Um, in one of our groups, we had a person uh, with visual impairment, and so we also, I made sure to stay with him after the focus group and uh, helped him to complete the uh, survey together. Um, so that was also something that I knew ahead of time and I planned for. Um, and I also offered breaks um, as well. Um, and so also just a note, I'm currently um, involved in a study at University of Toronto where we're developing an inclusive interview toolkit. Um, so within my focus groups, everyone was able to verbalize using words, but that's not always the case. Um, and so we're trying to create this interview toolkit to support people with intellectual disabilities who have different communication needs. Um, so a few other tips that we use in that is using pictures when asking questions, offering drawing as an option to respond. Um, questions are written on cards or on a board for everyone to see. Um, and also we've offered uh, providing the interview questions ahead of time for people to review um, and prepare what they want to, to express to us. Um, so more research is underway in that um, area. Um, and also thinking about accessibility within knowledge mobilization. So you can consider making an easy read for any publications. Uh, some journals actually accept this with your submission. Um, and so again, the easy read is just very simple, clear language uh, summary of uh, of the article. And there are many resources online now about how to um, create an easy read. And you can also consider getting creative um, with infographics or video explanations. 
Um, and also thinking about accessibility in your presentations as well. So I gave a visual description of myself within the introduction. Uh, I'm providing image descriptions, uh, large text, simple slides, high contrast. Um, some people also provide handouts of the slides. Um, so there are different ways to um, to make your presentations accessible. And uh, it's important because accessibility at this stage really can maximize the impact and reach of your research. So in summary, um, why should we all aim for accessible research? Um, accessible and inclusive research practices allow for diverse participation, um, ensuring that findings are representative of the broader population. Uh, so again, as we said, 16% of the global population has a disability. Um, it also broadens participation and improves the quality of your research by engaging different viewpoints. And many countries have laws and regulations that require research to be accessible to people with disabilities. Um, for ethics, uh, it's often required for researchers to consider uh, the needs of all potential participants and users uh, to ensure that no group is systematically excluded from participating or benefiting from the research. Uh, when the research is accessible, it can also um, be utilized by a wider audience, including policymakers, practitioners, educators, and the general public. Um, and this also can enhance the societal impact um, of your dissemination. And researchers can identify new methods and tools that enhance the research process for everyone. Um, and so here um, we can see that diverse and inclusive uh, environments encourage the development of novel ideas and methodologies that benefit all stakeholders. So that was all that I have uh, to share from my experiences. Uh, thank you again for joining and uh, I invite you uh, to share your thoughts um, or contact me if you have any ideas or strategies uh, so that together we can all make research more accessible. Thank you.